Welcome to my overview of Palace of the Dead. This is one of the deep dungeons of the game, a special kind of content with randomized floor layouts and its own gear and leveling progression. Unlocking it is as simple as progressing the main story quest to it passed into a copper hell at level 17. After completion, head over to the Gridania Adventurers Guild and talk to the Lalafell on a box. The quest itself is called The House That Death Built. Completion is merely talking to a person or three. Ending in Quarry Mill. If you couldn't tell from the crowd, Quarry Mill is the center of all events this content has. Palace of the Dead is not in the Duty Finder. You may only enter from the Wood Whaler on this platform. You can run around the area wall in queue, but you're going to have to remain in the area. It also keeps things tidy since all of the relevant NPCs are in this small section of the map. Let's get going inside and get exploring. It's all pretty simple really. Things aren't all too different to normal combat. Pick an enemy, kill an enemy. But you'll have to explore the floor a room at a time to find the exit. Enemies aren't too dangerous, but you still don't want to take on too many at a time. Thanks for watching my Palace of the Dead 1 to 100 introduction. This was a pretty short video, but I felt like it was worth talking about. I'll, I'll see you next time. Okay, now there's a lot more to this place. But consider this a warning of never trying to solo this. At least, not for a long time. While there are actually achievements based on soloing, you need a good amount of preparation if you want to succeed. 1 through 10 is a pretty doable goal early on, even when blind, but anything beyond the first 10 floors is going to hurt, and you'll only be wasting your time. In the absolute worst case, convince a bunch of friends to go through the dungeon with you. There are a couple of benefits to going in with a fixed party. What you otherwise want is a matched party if you can't get friends to group up. This will group you up with randoms like a normal dungeon. The queue to get in, at least at a good time of day, should be relatively short for the first set of floors. Just be sure you set aside a good chunk of time if you are pugging, as if you stop playing after a floor set or two, it may be difficult to get back into the dungeon. At least for the later floors. But let's backtrack a bit and properly structure an explanation of how all this works. So once again, prepare yourself, queue up, hopefully this time not solo, and head on in. Palace of the Dead and Deep Dungeons in general work in the following way. All your stats and gear going in do not matter. A first time Palace of the Dead player at level 1 and level 80 are both the exact same as you begin the instance at level 1. Killing enemies like normal will give you EXP like normal, but this isn't real EXP. Your level inside in no way reflects the level outside, so you won't be downgrading from level 80 to level 1 just because you went into Palace of the Dead. Level also only goes so far. Accuracy is calculated by level, so you want to level up enough to at least stop missing enemies, but the dungeon will do that part for you. The real reason to level is for your skill set, if anything. Even if you've not unlocked a skill outside of Palace of the Dead, it will unlock inside for hitting the correct level. So starting as a level 1 class, you'll quickly be flooded with new skills as you quickly level up. By the time you hit floor 10, you'll be over level 20 and obtain all of the skills up to your level. The only exception is roll actions. Even when you hit the required level for your roll actions, you won't obtain them until you actually hit the required level outside of Palace of the Dead. It's a weird line to draw, but that's just how it works. Further, as I mentioned, your gear does not matter either. You can come in naked and be stronger than someone who is armed to the teeth. The real source of our power is back on the file selection screen, Aether Pool values. Within Palace of the Dead, you'll find chests covered silver 
and these chests will upgrade your values randomly with some specifics changing the chances. But this is going to be the most important thing to find during your trip down the dungeon. This is especially true because the game outright expects you to meet minimum values of gear. When looking at a save file of later floors, it will list a gear requirement on the file in the bottom left. Because of this, you may end up not even being able to continue down just due to not gathering any gear through the instance, or getting weird RNG patterns that only give you armor, while your weapon suffers. But this is part of why we have two save files. If need be, you can start up the second save file just to gather some gear levels without truly starting over. Because notice the placement of this UI menu. Aether Pool is a separate section, because it's unrelated to save files. This is saved for your character, and will not lower itself no matter how many different runs you do. So the personal progression is as follows. Go through the floors killing enemies to level up. While killing, explore as many rooms as you can to find silver chests and open them. Together, this should boost your power up enough to get through just fine. But you can't just lower your guard. As you've already seen, let's talk about the actual journey. When you queue up, instances are grouped up by sets of 10 floors you must explore and find the exit of. Every 10th floor is just a boss fight. For completion of an instance, you are cleared to progress to the next set of floors. You will also gain a chunk of EXP for your class or job, and this is real EXP unlike the XP inside the instance. You will actually be able to level up so long as you complete the instance, which isn't guaranteed. Unlike most dungeons, if you all die, it's a wipe and the duty fails. You will have to start the instance all over if nobody is up to revive you all, which there is no releasing to the beginning of the dungeon. If you die, you stay dead until someone picks you up, which you may panic upon getting into the instance and see you have no healers. That's okay though, because Palace of the Dead is bound to account for all party makeups, provided you play it carefully and smartly. But let's backtrack a bit. Upon entering an instance, we have two windows open, the map and the character info window. Opening and closing the character menu opens up this rather than your normal character screen. It displays our class or job, EXP needed to level, Aether Pool gear, and a section for items, but these aren't the same as normal items. We'll get back to explaining items in a bit though. Meanwhile, the map is looking pretty bare. One square, some icons at the top, the floor number, and not much else. Palace of the Dead is structured randomly, as already mentioned, so rooms will all look like these boxes with openings on the sides for where you can progress to other rooms. There will be a number of different icons on rooms as you explore. The flag icon means the room you started the floor on. The two icons in the top left of the map also appear on the rooms themselves. The key icon is the exit to the floor. This orb on the floor that glows when you can leave. And the little tree icon. The tree icon is one of the most important pieces when you're grouped with a party that is reckless. This is the Cairn of Return. Given no other options of healing or resurrecting, the Cairn of Return will revive all dead players and spawn them at the Cairn. You cannot progress to the next floor without all players alive and at the exit, so you will need to find the cairn on any floor you have dead team members on. But you cannot just use these at any time. You are required a minimum amount of progress in the floor, measured in kill counts. The number of kills required can vary, but watch the icons in the top left of the map as you kill enemies. The icons will change color as you rack up kills to show your progress. Light blue, red, orange, and a solid white. Or at least the light blue turned very bright. 
It can skip some or all of these colors, depending on the floor's requirements. If you're colorblind, you can at least try and watch the icons on the map itself. The icons will be hollow and black when unusable when you find them, but light up when they become available. Further, chests will appear on the map when you enter rooms, but there will only be one icon at the top of the room. Even if there's multiple chests in the room, the chest rarity also affects the map icon. Gold chests will overwrite the presence of silver chests, even though silver chests are rarer and technically more important. As shown here by the silver sitting here, but the icon being gold. But let's take a second to talk about the chests themselves. There are three chest colors. As mentioned, the most important are the blue chests for gear upgrades. We also have gold chests which contain pomanders, the items mentioned in the character info panel. There's also bronze chests which can be important to even surviving as they contain potions, phoenix downs which are an item anyone may use to revive a fallen teammate, and later on special rare items called Gelmoran potsherds. We'll talk about these much later. For now though, you will want to open all chests you find including the potion chests. You don't have a healer always, so self-sustain is very useful. But bronze chests are also the most deadly too. This place is filled with deadly traps, and the chests are included. Silver chests have the potential to explode, doing around 80% of your health in a single hit. It's always based on max health, so you can potentially instantly die from opening a silver chest just because you weren't fully healed. If you see a silver chest and you aren't topped off, wait a second for health regen to kick in. Or die. That works too. Don't be surprised if people get upset though. Also, try not to open them around other people. The explosion is an AoE, so everyone can be wiped out in a single blast if they're all close enough and not fully healed. Gold and bronze chests have a different trap. They can be mimics. Bronze chests seem to have a fairly sizable chance at being trapped, while gold chests have very low chances. But anytime it's a trap, you must drop everything to focus on the mimic. And hopefully your entire party does the same. Mimics always spawn at high levels, even if you're on a low level floor. So seeing a level 20 Mimic at level 5 isn't exactly impossible. Only open chests when outside of combat because either exploding or spawning the most dangerous enemy in all of Palace of the Dead. Mimics not only are high level, but are strong when evenly matched as well. They also have the singular strongest debuff in the game. Pox on your mailman, that is to say, Pox on one of the people fighting the Mimic for 10 minutes. It can be interrupted by players who have interrupt abilities, and it very much should be prioritized, as Pox has two effects. It completely stops HP regen. Even if you aren't in battle, you will not regenerate HP at all. Further, you have a significant dot on you, Sure, at the lower levels, it can be only like 1 or 2 HP lost per tick of damage, but it lasts for 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes of no HP regen and constantly taking damage. And remember, you can't just wait it out because you need to kill enemies to progress. There is a cure though, and you can be healed during it. We'll talk about that in the section about Palmanders. The takeaway here is most importantly, open chests after battle, not during. Make sure you stick together as a team, lest a Mimic steamroll all of you one at a time. As for the rest of the traps, every single room, aside from the starting room, has a chance to have a trap on the ground. If you step on it, it will activate and you cannot see the traps without a pomander. So when randomly exploring the dungeon, you can step on a trap and set things off. 
but there's only one trap per room. There's two ways you can handle this. Walk down only the direct center of rooms, or follow the walls perfectly. The latter option tends to be preferable due to some other strategies we'll get into, but point is, treat the majority of the room as the floor is lava type of scenario, unless you can afford some risk, such as being in a very strong party. Even then though, you could kill everyone due to the types of traps there are. Some of the traps are fairly inconsequential based on who steps on them. One turns you into a toad, another gives you a damage taken and delivered debuff, but most dangerous are the lore, landmine, and silence traps. Landmine traps are just like the exploding silver chests, but they feel like they also have a much larger range. Any and all allies or enemies caught in the explosions will take 80% damage instantly. So in a messy scenario, this can easily get someone killed out of nowhere. The lure trap is also extremely deadly. It will spawn three random enemies into the room and automatically aggro them onto whoever stepped on the trap. You can't step on the trap and just ignore the enemies. You must kill them. And if your party is low gear or no tank or such, three enemies at once can be rough. Silence traps stop you from using weapon skills and spells, but you can still use abilities. Mages might want to take some echo herbs with them at all times to quickly negate the silence so that they can keep attacking. Melee people just have to deal with it, or hope that the healer will use Asuna. But the fact that you can't attack at all is hugely damaging. So don't just run around rooms like crazy, unless you know you can handle what's to come. There's another trap type too, floor effects. Some floors can have up to two random effects applied. Some of them are beneficial, but on the average, they're detrimental to a high degree. Lowered attack damage, the gloom which makes enemies faster and stronger and puts an ugly mist in the air, or turning off health regeneration just like pox. So that means there are layers of traps, all incentivizing you to take things slow, but not without constantly cutting a path forward. Slow and steady, but also not a turtle's pace. There's generally a lot of leeway in this all, obviously enough, especially on the starting floors, but the deeper you delve, the more careful you will want to be, especially with random players. You don't know their intentions, so you want to take care to account for all of them as well as your own actions. But from there, it's pretty simple in execution. Run through each floor, kill enemies, open chests, and gather into the circle of the activated exit portal to continue to the next floor, repeat eight more times, and then fight a boss with extremely simple mechanics but you have tools to fight back against the odds, tools called Pawmanders. Pawmanders come in many flavors, 16 flavors to be precise, each one with a unique effect that is going to be worth testing and knowing how to properly use. You can carry a max of three of each Pawmander, so let's go over each one. Starting, we have the Pawmander of Sight. This will reveal both the entire map the stuff in each room as normal, and all traps. This is the only way you can see traps without first stepping on them, but we can also just be rid of the traps entirely with the Palmander of Safety. All traps on the floor are immediately cleansed, though you can still get mimics and floor effects stay applied. Next up are the Palmanders of Strength and Steel. These are self-explanatory, 8 minute long strength and defense buffs. They're also not exactly tiny buffs, so they're very much worth it. Your strongest attacker and strongest defender should aim to always have one of these up to make them even better. The next three Palmanders are Affluence, Flight, and Alteration. Affluence will increase the number of chests found on the next floor, while Flight will reduce the number of enemies spawned to start. 
and may also actually spawn fewer enemies than normal past the beginning, as some enemies will just randomly spawn as you continue the floor. The interesting part of the three is the Palmander of Alteration. I'm going to guess there's a 50-50 chance of each of the possibilities, but it seems like it's always scaled in the less favorable aspect. If you get heads, all enemies in a single room will become Mandragoras. Mandragoras are passive, don't fight back, and die in one hit. It's a free room. That is to say, a free singular room. This can be extremely significant in the deepest floors of Palace of the Dead and Heaven on High, but not in any of the normal floors, and can also be extremely, significantly bad. The other half the time, the thing I see more often, the room is changed to Mimics, and we have already discussed, Mimics are extremely dangerous. They are strong and can apply Pox, the deadliest debuff in all of Palace of the Dead, and the entire room will be turned into Mimics. This can be a huge problem in any floor with layouts that force you to go through the Mimic Room, especially if it's a Monster Closet. Simply put, Monster Closets are rooms with like 10 or more enemies all just sitting inside of it. This can happen a lot if you didn't also use a Palmander of Flight. So imagine 10 Mimics stuffed into a single room and you have to get through it. Not a good situation. In the best case scenario, you only need to take out three or four of the Mimics to open a path around the edge of the room. But it could be worse, and it could be the exit room or such. So do you want to take the risk? Until very late, I'd say floor 151 plus, the Palm Adder isn't worth it for the benefit. But that deep in, Mimics are even more dangerous. Pox is around 10 times stronger, so I personally wouldn't even try it. But in the odd case you do get hit with Pox, you can pull out a Palmander of Purity. This will remove Pox instantly. It's a simple effect, but extremely powerful. If multiple party members have Pox, have the person with the higher timer use the Purity before the person with the shorter timer. If you have to wait out the timer, at least the person with the shorter timer will be able to get on with their lives much sooner. Next is the Palmander of Fortune. This one is a matter of luck. Use it at the start of a floor for maximum effect, but this increases the chance an enemy will drop a treasure chest by a pretty large amount. Enemies have a natural drop rate, but this helps a lot if you're looking for chests. Just remember, it's only a chance. You can still kill most of the floor and maybe only see one or two chests drop from enemies. Skipping ahead one Palmander, we have Serenity. This simply removes floor effects. This includes the effect that turns your items into stone, even if you have the floor effect running. You can still use Serenity, even though Serenity is an item which makes even the worst floor effect combos completely safe. But also realize this will turn off any beneficial floor effects too. And floors can have both a positive and a negative effect at the same time. So you have to choose. Do you leave the beneficial effect and still have to deal with the negative one? Or do you get rid of both effects? Backtracking one and going ahead one, we have the Palmanders of Witching and Rage. These two I would classify as emergency buttons. Don't use these at random. If for some reason you end up fighting, say, six enemies at once, you'll want to use a Witching to turn all of the enemies into much less dangerous chickens. They do still hurt though, so it's not completely solved. The other option is Rage. Rage will turn you into a very slow-moving manticore that one-shots all enemies. This is amazing for clearing the last floors of an instance. People tend to save these for floors 7, 8, and 9 of each section just to essentially skip those floors. 
but this can be the most effective emergency button in the hands of someone who knows how to strafe and attack. Also no, it does not work on bosses, don't even bother trying it. The reason why though, is because it requires the knockback to take effect. Bosses are immune to knockback, and there's also a floor effect that negates all knockback. So the floor effect to negate all knockback is essentially an anti-rage effect. Next we have the Pawmander of Lust. The only real use of this Pawmander is for bosses. Normal enemies are not strong enough to warrant using Lusts, at least in any of the normal floors. It turns you into a succubus with one attack, a fireball that gives a vault up to the enemy's hit for about 90 seconds. This can be stacked up to five times and if you use a lust you absolutely should go for the five stacks. The succubus is way weaker than your normal attacks will be so start the boss fight with lust, get the vault stacks, then end the buff prematurely by clicking off the buff if you can. Now for the Pawmander of Intuition. Something I didn't mention yet is the bag icon with a number in the items menu. This is the number of accursed horde pieces found. Some floors, but not all floors, have one of these. You can, by absolute chance, find the accursed horde without the use of intuition, but that will be purely luck or having an extreme knowledge of how maps work in this place. Using intuition though, will tell you on the map you eye when you're on a floor with a horde. This will be a small golden beam of light sticking out of the ground. To unearth an accursed horde, with or without intuition, stand on top of it for several seconds. Intuition merely tells you where to stand. Upon clearing an instance, you can trade these in outside with the bishop. You have to trade them one at a time and it's really slow. But you can get some very good rewards out of them. Or fireworks. Yay! The rarity of the horde is based on the floor set. Every 50 floors has a different item pool, with the rarest of the rare items being below floor 150 but even the 1 to 100 stuff can sell nicely, or be something you want to use yourself. Speaking of the deeper floors, there are two Palmanders only obtainable after floor 50. These are the Palmander of Raising and Palmander of Resolution. Palmander of Raising is another possible emergency fix, but is a proactive one rather than reactive. Using this Palmander will bink one free raise that will automatically revive the first person to die and fully heal them, but only one person. Even if you all die at once, it's worth always having this up when you can though. Palmander of Resolution is basically only usable on the floor 100 boss. The most you can really say is that it stuns normal enemies. The boss on Floyd 100 spawns ads that will die, but soon revive automatically unless killing with Karibo or their dead bodies burned with the holy attack. But yeah, that's the only reason to bring it up. And as a note, all Palmanders can be used multiple times even after one has been used. So be careful using a Palmander if it has already been used. So say an intuition is already running, using another intuition will still use the Palmander for no new effect. That covers each of the Palmanders and I went over some general rules, but here's some more. If you try to open a chest that has a Palmander you are capped on, such as a Palmander of Strength, just use the Palmander on yourself and pick up the new one. There's no reason to just leave it. Further, actually be using Palmanders. They help runs go by a lot faster and safer. Be sure to also try to spread out your uses of sight and safety. One per floor until the end if you are flooded with them. If you can see traps, you can avoid them. If you can delete traps entirely, you don't have to dodge them at all. 
the overlap between these two uses isn't worth it, unless, again, you have both of them maxed and are near the end. Fortune and Affluence always have one running if you have them. More chests means more potential rewards and gear increases. Same goes for Intuition. More Accursed Hordes means potentially more money if it's stuff you want to sell. So, that's a lot of info, but altogether it looks like this. Queue up for a party, have sufficient time to try and do 50 floors for queue time reasons. Explore floors, kill enemies, avoid traps if you can. Open chests for paw manners to make the run faster. Open silver chests to beef up your stats and make you not worthless on later floors. Hit 10th floor, kill boss, move on to the next floor, repeat steps until you reach the end, specifically floor 50 and floor 100. All of the bosses are basically jokes. They don't put up a fight, except for the floor 50 boss. This boss is the single one that might actually cause you to wipe. See this eye icon? Non-negotiable, turn your character to look away. You will die and wipe the party if you do not turn your character away. It took me three tries to do floors 41 to 50 because people wouldn't look away. And this is even after I explained to them how to look away. Mechanics are more important than your DPS. Dodge every AoE, especially if there is no tank. DPS can survive pretty long, but you need the full party to survive and do things right. See these symbols on the ground? For every person who fails to dodge her AoEs, a sigil will light up, increasing the damage done by her raid-wide AoE that she will occasionally do. Five seals is an instant wipe no matter what defense you have. Look away so you don't get hit with hysteria, dodge the AoEs, keep popping potions, and any other defensive abilities you have. And I truly mean it when I say this is the only threatening boss on the journey to floor 100. Head outside after clearing floor 50 and you could do a new side quest, aka just talking to the Wood Whaler to unlock floors 51 through 100. Before making a trip to floor 100, go get your job stone. People tend to grind floors 51 through 60 for aether pool gear, at least decent amounts before going on. At least get past 40-40 before heading for floor 100, and this grind for aether pool gear should help you reach your job at level 30. The bosses might be pitiful, but you still need to survive the trip to the boss and every upgrade, including your job stone, will protect you from the monsters. It may not actively make your power go up, but you'll have way more skills with more options that also do have more power to them. Also be warned, you cannot change role on a save file. If a save file has you as a specific role, you are that role until you delete the save. So even swapping from Archer to Bard makes the save file unusable as a Bard. You'll have to delete and start the file over. Luckily, for completing floor 50, we can start from floor 51 anytime we want. We never have to go back to floor 1. You may have also noticed your defeat of floor 50 gave you some free Aether Pool and a Gilmore and Potsherd. Bronze chests have a really low chance to drop these, at least until higher floors where the chances go up, but these floors 50 and 100 are guaranteed drops. The only items of note are the minions, the mount, and the potions. If you ever intend on trying to get past floor 100, you want these potions. The items are nice, and the materia is basically worthless. Also for completion of floor 50, and later on floor 100, you can obtain a level 60 weapon that looks good, but is actually weaker than what you can buy with Tome Stones of Poetics. It's a filler weapon, or a glamour weapon. You must sacrifice 10 levels of your Aether Pool gear to create Aether Pool grips, 
which is pretty huge of a loss if you are actively grinding Palace of the Dead. Try to only make grips when your gear is constantly capped, but this does not necessarily mean 99.99. Each individual floor has a gear cap, as noted by the orange coloring of the gear text. This massively reduces your chances of getting upgrades from silver chests on a floor when it is orange. So only trade for grips once you start seeing this often. Keep your gear high otherwise. But that's all for the normal stuff, explaining how it all works and what to do. Let's get into more specific strats, strats that I actually personally use to survive. Explosions are a double-edged sword. If you make a mistake such as pulling a giant group of enemies, it may actually be worth it to open a blue chest or step on a nearby landmine mid-fight. If your entire party aggroed the enemies too, but maybe some are ranged players, you can go for the suicide play to save everyone else's lives. Open the chest hoping it explodes or step on the mine. This will weaken you to near death, but it also will take out your enemies too. Even if they survive, they're now so low on health that your allies can take them out with an attack or two. It's an emergency play in most cases, but it is worth it if you lack a Witching or Rage Palmander. But there's a couple other strategies to not worry about using this strategy specifically. You're really only ever going to get overrun with enemies if you fight in the middle of rooms. Instead of that, drag enemies back into hallways. Use a ranged attack, then get out. Hallways may be cramped, but they never have traps. They're at least big enough to dodge all the enemy attacks that will be sent out. You will want to watch your back though, because most floors have patrolling types of enemies. Even while playing safe and fighting in hallways, you could randomly get overrun by two or three patrols at once. If you see a patrolling type enemy, prioritize killing that before any others, so long as you don't overextend and grab other enemies besides while trying to pull the patrolling one. Patrolling enemies are not always the most dangerous, but they can be. But just by the nature of being patrols, be wary of their existence and always watch your back. Take them out first anytime you get the chance. Further protection comes into play with pretending to play solo no matter what. Never attack more enemies than you can take on by yourself. That probably amounts to one maybe two enemies total. Do not attack more than that without your party being extremely geared or well prepared. Maybe it's a middle tier floor and you have a well-rounded party of a tank, healer, and two DPS. The tank and healer together can handle bigger pools, but because you can get anyone on any battle class or job, nothing is guaranteed. This can be played fast and loose a little with pulling maybe two enemies instead of just one at a time, but keep in mind your allies may be spreading out around the floor, or pulling enemies from the same room that are different than the ones you pulled. But your allies may still end up getting overrun due to one reason or another, even while you played it safe. They ran into the room and got five enemies at once, patrols came in making it worse, etc. Since we're always pretending to be solo, we've not been attacking with AoE, despite the five or six enemies being pulled at once. But our allies didn't take the same idea to heart and all wind up dead. It's now truly you alone. Keeping yourself alive saved the run, but you'll have to fight your way to the cairn of return. Take one enemy at a time and you can reach it revive everyone, and completely turn things around. Or, you know, be an Arcanist and have a revive at all times. Or at least have a Phoenix down on you to make it a duo as you try to get to the Cairn of Return. 
Point is, I used this exact strategy and saved a run when the party ended up going into the middle of a room and having to fight five enemies at once. They didn't even make it to half health before the enemies killed them. I had only attacked one enemy, so I was able to take it out, backtrack a bit, and go unlock the Cairn of Return. This saved the run. We still died on floor 50 though. The distinction here is that dungeons are worth risking your lives for in big pools because the entire party is a normal setup and you lose maybe a minute of your time for a wipe. A wipe here in Palace of the Dead is entirely going to undo the entire run, which if you just had a run of 10 silver chests with big upgrade values, you just lost all of that. Made it to floor 50, you just lost all of that. You have to go back and start over from floor 41. But there is one strategy that is like a risk, but is overall worth it. Following walls doesn't just minimize trap threats, it minimizes enemy threat from patrols too. Rather than defeating all enemies in a room, ignore the ones out of the way. If the left half of the room is relatively empty, kill off whatever there is and follow the wall to avoid enemies on the right side of the room. Just be sure you and your allies all follow the wall perfectly, and if someone accidentally pulls an enemy, make sure to help kill it. Remember, you need to be watching your back for patrols, so you should be watching your back at all times. You can also use this corner cutting technique to spy into many rooms and even grab chests from inside the room without fighting a single enemy. This is a have your cake and eat it too scenario, so don't push your luck. Typically, I will cut corners to see if there's any silver chests in the room and ignore the room entirely if nothing is in an easy position, especially if it's an optional room. And most importantly, Work as a team. Don't go AFK at the exit because you don't need Aetherpool gear. Other people do. But also don't insist on clearing every single room of every floor, especially if the rest of your team isn't into it. Yeah, walking one step into the next room is fine, but if it lacks any sort of good chests, like maybe a blue one, just move on. There's four of you work together, especially you people who AFK at the exit. That's just plain toxic. But also, do try to have fun. The place is only a grind if you force it to be one. Explore, get rewards, and enjoy it. There's no point if you aren't having fun. Dungeons are still there if you want to do something else, so go do it. So you may have heard by this point about people grinding Palace of the Dead floors 51 through 60 for EXP and not for Palace of the Dead itself. This has led to many, many issues across the last two expansions. Back in Stormblood, for example, everyone thought Samurai didn't have positionals, an issue caused by Palace of the Dead, and not reading. This kind of proves a theory I have, that Palace of the Dead is the single worst place for learning a job. It will, at best, let you preview the skills in any job you wish to play, but only after first hitting 30 to unlock the job. Since jobs are where most of your skills come from, you have to work your way through the class anyway. As such, you either spend so long in Palace of the Dead, you learn bad habits from having only half your toolkit, or bad habits because enemies in Palace of the Dead are so weak when you have gear that they die instantly, even if you have weak gear really. They're just in general lower HP than your average dungeon mob. You have to basically be fighting solo every time for enemies to last long enough to do anything but a few GCDs, and even then they still die faster than your typical dungeon mob while maximum eye level and all four of you are wailing on it. 
further, you never really get a chance to try your AoE out. You need at least a tank for it to be safe to even attempt big pulls. And ideally, you want to heal it there too. At that point, you'll end up in these weird scenarios where half your toolkit is bad or useless because enemies are dying too fast for any effect or aren't in big enough numbers. And more importantly, people trying for EXP to grind these jobs, they don't know, are getting very little EXP. There are better places to earn EXP. You'll even be better off doing normal queuing with slow queues. That's how little EXP Palace of the Dead tends to actually be worth. It's also quote unquote so boring I hear basically everyone say about Palace of the Dead grinding. Why are you even Palace of the Deading then? You don't like it. You don't learn how to play your job in any way, meaning when you are forced to go back to dungeons, you can't even play your job right, and it isn't even that much EXP. Go gather and craft in queue times and do normal dungeons. Or go to your grand company and do your adventurous squadron. That's still better EXP, and as bad as squadron AI is, you're at least doing actual dungeons and being forced to do stuff. I consider Palace of the Dead as a similar situation to level skips. Many people have commented on my videos in passing, used a level skip, no idea what to do now, and used my video to learn because they had no idea what to do. Unless you tend to do something similar with any guys at all, Palace of the Dead is going to put you in basically the same situation. It's essentially a level skip, but potentially more detrimental because you'll teach yourself to do the opposite of what a good player would do in a normal situation. In summation, just do roulettes and dungeons, or even go to your squads with your grand company. I hear that squads are worth amazing EXP too, but I cannot attest to that myself. I'll just give it a mileage may vary warning until I can. Palace of the Dead is just bad EXP, bad learning, and a lot of people find it boring because they treat it like a zerg spamming floors 51 to 60 forever. At some point the realization that playing the way they do just removes all the fun sets in and end up saying how awful the content as a whole is. It all ends up being a giant feedback loop of disappointment. And this content deserves better. And better it has when going for runs to the bottom floor. A casual run of Palace of the Dead will end at floor 100 no matter what. But there are 200 floors. 101 plus are considered the hard mode floors. Every single boss, aside from the floor 150 boss, which is a succubus instead of Edda, and the floor 200, which is just the end, is the same exact fight as the first 100 floors. Floor 110 is the death gaze enemy, 120 is the plant, etc, etc. But they are way, way stronger than before. Enemies only continue to scale up in power, but you can't just enter these floors anytime you want. To enter floors 101 through 200, you have to have the requirements of being a fixed party with zero party wipes. The moment this number is no longer zero, you may not do any floors past 100. So even if you are on floor 199 and wipe, your run is permanently over. You must start over from at least floor 51. This is a challenge worth taking though, as the accursed hordes below floor 150 are extremely good. I can't say what your hordes will have or your service prices, but on Midgard, the Knight Pegasus Whistle sells for over 10 million per whistle, and that's only found in the final 50 floors. So you could potentially get rich from a trip down to floor 200. Don't try doing it solo though. I would rate Palace of the Dead solo to floor 200 as quite possibly the single hardest challenge in the entire game. 
harder than even ultimate content. You will be better off only attempting to solo after at least one clear as a party. Party journeys absolutely go for a one tank, one healer, two DPS makeup. Especially those that have raises available. But there is some flexibility as long as you know how to be careful and know the job you're playing. Oh, and no matter what, do not try going in until you have close to maximum Aether Pool. At least 80-80 I would say. But personally, I wouldn't start until I was over 90. The deepest floors are truly that painful. And I'm not going to go much deeper in onto this info. This video is already very long, so instead of going deeper in, I'll look into doing another video on this, but it will take a long time to get done, because again, the trip to floor 200 is extremely difficult, and especially so is going solo. A lot of the tactics you will use on floors 1 through 100 will change or no longer be relevant once you are getting into the deeper floors. And some new strategies start coming into play, because without them, you will probably die. But if you would like a good place to talk about deep dives here or in Heaven on High, the Stormblood version of this place, you can join the Deep Divers Discord. You will find plenty of info and knowledge on how to handle trips to the bottom, and even make teams for the travel to the bottom. The link will be in the description for those interested. Speaking of Heaven on High though, it's basically entirely the same with a few small additions. You can find some animals that give buffs, and silver chests can now contain primal shards, which are extremely powerful map clearers. It's also a 30-70 split of casual floors to hardcore floors, since it only lasts for 100 floors. There's also some new floor layouts, but generally, it's all the same stuff. This video is already way too long, but the nuances do have more info worth going over, so keep that in mind. But that about covers it. There's always more nuance than what can be gone over reasonably because every party is different. Ultimately, just be sure to play as a team and don't take too much responsibility by yourself. You can take some, but don't overdo it. If you split off alone, be sure not to be overly risky, and still don't be overly risky even with your group. Good luck on your dives down to the depths. Thanks for watching my overview of Palace of the Dead and a bit of Deep Dungeons in general. I hope you learned a thing or two and know better how to avoid death. This can be very fun content if you treat it as it was intended. Naturally, anything becomes worse when you treat it as something it was never meant to be. But take care, and may the power of Ananit Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Bubalao, Fisher, Jalex, Kathy Nock, Lemon, Meowfy, and Nick. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, the link is down below in the description. Thanks for watching.